Tracy Cleland is Dr. Tracy Cleland is the, an, an adjunct pref, uh, lecturer, sorry, in the School of Health Sciences from the University of Canterbury. Uh, Tracy joins us all the way from China. Hi, Tracy. Hi. How are you? Yeah, doing very well. Did you enjoy the Jason Momoa clip like the rest of us I did? I did, actually. And once we um, get talking in our conversation, I'll make some cool points about it, actually. Oh, okay. Oh. Very, very good. Now, listen, uh, Tracy, the reason we've got you on is you have written a piece that I think went up into the conversation today uh, titled uh, Ignore the Politics. Many parents want to work with schools on sexuality education. Um, this is really, I don't know if you're writing it based around this or more about your research and what Nicola Willis said is sort of a, a, a a sort of a byproduct for you to get into your conversation. But uh, to read a paragraph or two from here before we throw you the ball, National Party Deputy Leader Nicola Willis, Nic Nicola Willis recently told a public meeting that sex education was a job for her and her husband. Quote, based on our values and our views of the world, I want my education system focused on teaching my children how to read, how to write, how to do maths, end quote. While Willis may have had a uh, receptive audience, interviews with parents of children aged between 11 and 14 show she may be in the minority. Now, I'm a parent of a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old, but 14-year-old and 17-year-old who are still at school, uh, both girls. And um, this is a conversation which interests me greatly. But I think to start with, like we love to do here, we're just going to throw you the ball, Tracy, and uh, let you pick up where I've left off. Tell us about the article, tell us about your research, and tell us why perhaps Nicola Willis might not have it as right as many parents would like us to believe. Right, well, the question is, where do you start? <laughs> um, can I tell you a little bit about myself first? I, I Please think do. that gives a bit of context, and, and as I said to you, Pat, what I like is we don't have to rush, because it's, it is a complicated topic. We know that, right? So first of all, I'm a a researcher and I'm also a teacher and I'm a sexuality educator and I've got two teenage sons okay, okay. so I've got a, a well, what are they now 18 and 19 and they've had a mother who's a sexuality educator for the whole lifetime good lord I know and uh, it's funny because you just said you had a, a 19 year old as well Pat yep now I don't know how what kind of conversations you have with your 19 year old but my son who's 19 you know we have the most awesome conversations about the world. And when I'm talking about the world, I'm talking about how the world is, you know, gendered, the sexuality, what's expected of young boys, all those kind of things that is relationships and sexuality education. But that was built from conversations from when my children were born, you know, and that's what we seem to forget. It's, it's the conversations I'm having with him, but then he is going out to the world every day and learning about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what's expected. And your clip was around, um, you know, you talked about um, hard on, porn, the Fast and Furious movies. Now, <laughs> all those movies are full of gendered messages, right? And pe young people are making sense of it every single day from the minute that they're born, right? And when Nicola says that, you know, sexuality education or sex education, so we've got to get to that in a moment, all right? Yeah, because it's changed. Eh? It's changed from when I was yeah. at school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So sex education by parents. Yes, of course, parents are important. It's a shared conversation. And young people have told us they want to hear their parents' values. But they also want to hear other people's values. They're, they're trying to make sense of this world, right? And what we forget with her comment is there's a lot of parents from my research, you know, young people have said their parents don't say anything or it's very negative messages. And I'll give you an example. One young person said, oh, you know, we so need this stuff because, you know, my dad just winds down the window and says, oh, you're pretty hot. You know, <laughs> would you like my son's phone number? Yikes. <laughs> and that's a 14-year-old boy, right, 14. And so the reason I'm telling you that is that sets the scene. So I've been in this space for 30 years now. I started off as a family planning educator because I was really passionate about well-being, all right? Not just about sex, because it is relationships and sexuality education. And I know I'm going to talk lots because that's what I do, because I'm really passionate about this. And one of the things I say to my students is, you know, sex doesn't occur between bodies, it occurs between people. Right. right? And you know how hard relationships are. They take work. And that's what relationships and sexuality education is. All right. So 
But what I'm trying to say is it's complicated. You've got schools and how they're teaching. You've got parents and what they're doing. And then you've got young people making sense of the world. So my research crosses across all areas. We've been working with teachers. I've been interviewing young people. And I've also been interviewing parents. So where do you want me to start? Do you see a disparity <laughs> between what the young people want, what the parents want, and what the teachers want? Yep, totally. Um, teachers are probably much more in line with what young people want. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Parents are shifting that way. Now, I have to be careful here because when you look at the media and we have people like Nicola saying, parents don't want this or this is her job, Australian research and New Zealand research has shown that over 90% of parents in New Zealand actually do want some form of relationships and sexuality education. All right? so, that, so that's a minority position that she's holding. Yes, it is. But it's a very loud voice, as you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong, there are things we need to consider. So schools can always do better. Parents can do better. But young people we interviewed over our, um, the last six months um, to up to a year they basically told us, look, we're not getting what we need. We've got the whole issue of pornography, gender norms, changing families, diverse sexualities, and we need to talk about this stuff because otherwise we have no one. And I have to give you some quotes because quotes to me tell you what's going on for young people. For sure. We asked this young boy who was um, 13, uh, sorry, uh, he was 14, and he said, well, we asked him, how do you learn about relationships and sexuality education? He goes, look, it's like Nike says, you just do it. <laughs> and you imagine if I told that to a parent about, we're going to teach your child to drive, just get in and have a go. Yeah. Right? People would be like, ah. And I often, when I'm teaching, I talk about um, relationships and sexuality is like learning to drive. You, you learn the skills as you go and you need some guidance along the way. So if parents are the only people who do it, what messages are they getting? They're getting one view, right? Whereas they need to understand that there is diverse ways of being. You know, not everyone likes the same person, not everyone wants to be the same. We want a society that's tolerant and open, or we end up like America, mm. where we actually start um, abolishing rights for people, and that's, that scares me. So yeah, young people said they were feeling like they were being left to their own devices. That's, that's the words they use, their devices being their phones, how they learn. Isn't that ironic? That's not just a metaphor anymore. It's actually literal as well, being left to their own it devices. Is. Yeah. Shall you got anything, mate? Yeah, um, just reading through the article, there, there's one thing that really um, jumped out at me is that uh, sex and health education really kicked off in the 80s. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I obviously had the benefit of that going through schools, so obviously yeah. pretty early version of it. But it would seem to me that the parents of, uh, you know, people of my generation that are having kids are, are the first generation of kids that have had a more cohesive sex education upbringing. Yeah. Um, whereas beforehand, yeah, it, it was down to a very embarrassing birds and the bees conversation with dad, probably over some duck shooting down here. Um, <laughs> or, or going out to a farm and going, yeah, like that, but with people. Um, <laughs> and I, I think I'm sure the stats bear this out that we've seen the benefits in society overall yeah. like teen pregnancy is, has dropped um, you know sexually transmitted diseases have dropped through the floor um, yeah. all of that stuff so to have Nicola Willis come out and go I reckon me and, me and the fella here can do a better job than this is, yeah. is frightening what and, 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 and that's such a great point because what it also shows is a lack of understanding of education right so mm. education is about learning critical thinking skills challenging the way that society works so that we don't always just go down one pathway and it's about 1999 the curriculum really shifted to be much more holistic so not physical sex but sexuality so emotional social um, and spiritual. Now, spiritual is about what are your values and beliefs? So a health educator, and I've been one for a long time, you're not telling them that this is the right way or this is what you should do. It's exploring how people have different values and attitudes. Mm. And you're right, Chewie, 
we've had a um, decrease in the amount of um, young people actually even having sexual intercourse, but we've and we've had decrease in teenage pregnancies, etc. But the research shows if you focus on education and the skills, the skills to negotiate those tricky relationships, right? Communication, assertiveness, decision making. Young consent. people are more well, consensual part of assertiveness, mm. communication, yeah, yeah. right? Because I have a bit of an issue. We often say we're going to teach consent, right? Well, how do you teach consent? You've got to also look at how do you teach communication skills? Because what do you do when someone is trying to pressure you into that? All right. So it's so much more complicated. And consent is also based around gender norms, right? So there's a lot of gendered assumptions of, oh, but other people would do this, other girls do this. And that pressure pays a part. So education is about helping young people use scenarios to say, what could you do? You could do A, B, C, or D, because you don't know what's going to happen in that moment, right? And if you're only hearing your parents' values of this is what you should do or this is what happens, what happens when other people have different values and that's yeah. impacting on you? And so I have taught, you know, this subject for 30 years and I have been through the ups and downs where people go, well, why are we teaching kids about sex? And I deal with the other side where I work with young people who have been kicked out of home because they were gay or they're having a real... Um, domestic violence type relationships well they've never talked about love with their partner you know and that's the joy of the subject i'll give you an example this because this is what sexuality education is about about building healthy relationships so i was in this class and we were doing a whole uh, lessons around love etc and it was with my second year university students and lots of them in this class said this was the first time they'd ever had really good in-depth discussions about anything to do with these topics. You know, this was 19-year-olds, right? Um, some of them had good quality school education. Some of them could talk to their families. Some couldn't, right? So diversity. And anyway, we did this whole lecture on love and lots of discussion. But the next day they came back and, and this young boy said, right, I want to start the class. Because you can do that in my class. <laughs> when does said, that great. happen? <laughs> that's great because that's what it's meant. This is the share. This is what learning's about, right? And he said, I want to tell a story. He said, I went home and talked to my partner. She's 20. And I said, we learned about love languages today. And you know what? We realized we show our love in different ways. And we ended up talking for an hour about our relationship. Isn't that cool? Wow. Mm. Isn't that yeah. what it's meant to be about? Yeah. And yet, so it's not just parents. Parents are, they are there, okay? Parents have a responsibility, but we'll talk about what that responsibility looks like in a minute. But sexuality is occurring everywhere. You're learning from movies, TV, your friends. So school offers that critical lens to say, what do you think about this? How does this harm well-being or how does it enhance well-being? And what about cultural diversity too? So... Hey, um, Tracy, how does it, how does society approach like age appropriate conversations and how does that fit mm. into the education sector? Because a lot of the time when you hear a, a conservative type person, you know, whether yep. they're a religious person or whatever, it seems to always be talking about that. And, and uh, I only bring up this, this picture of this book because it's uh, in the news at the moment. It seems to be quite controversial. I'm not sure why I haven't read the book. I'm Welcome not, to see I'm not neither denouncing nor upholding the book, yep. but we, I've seen um, comments going around by people saying, this is in the library for 10 year olds saying as young as eight can read it. But when I looked it up, it's like recommended for 14, 15 and above. Yep. So I kind of wonder how, how do we communicate? How do we, I guess, how do you communicate yep. with society as to what is age appropriate, what is not. And I'll, and I'll preface that by you know using some information from your article. I think it was 53% of 11 to 14 year olds have seen pornography. So my right. 14, my 14 year old may have already seen a little bit or witnessed yeah. on video or something what anal sex mm -hmm. is. That book yeah. talks about it and explains it. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you push back or where is the line between like a conservative parent or a conservative school and what is actually age appropriate and what is not? Oh, where do I start? Okay, first of all, I know, because this, I wrote, you need to read my thesis, right? 
took me six years to do it, but it's now available in the library. And I've got five chapters and of findings, but I talk a lot about what's age appropriate. The problem is that's a constructed term of what is a child, all right? We have constructed who determines what is a child or not, and we've also constructed what's age appropriate or not. And, you know, parents need to take some of their own um, responsibility. That's really important to, to know your child. But we also have to remember that those young people are learning about the world. So you just told me about the anal sex, but your son uh, might have seen it, or daughter, right? The reality is they are seeing a lot of stuff online. Yeah. But most of them are curious, or it's accidental, and most of them actually don't like it. They want to talk about it. Okay, so that's one thing. I'm going to give you an example before I start the answer to that question. So one of the parents in my group set up an environment where her children could ask anything. If you had a question, it was totally fine. Um, and basically, she told the story of her nine-year-old. And her nine-year-old came to her and said, oh, can I ask you something? She goes, of course you can, sweetie. And then the child said, can I write it down? I don't want to say it. She said, of course you can. Anyway, carrying on. And he said, can we go into the bedroom? She's like, of course you can. <laughs> anyway, the question was, I heard they were talking at school and I want to know where the poo goes when people have anal sex. Now, that was a question from a nine-year-old. Wow, and wow. if you want to have, know how the parent answered it, you can see my thesis. But they answered it beautifully. And what that showed you is that young people are making sense of the world. And I'm not saying good sense but they are trying to make sense of it. And if you don't have those spaces, where do you go? And that's the first thing. Same thing. So when we come back to age, because I'm going to talk about age in a minute, I had, um, I brought home a report when I was, I've been doing this field for a long time, and I worked with the classification office around pornography and writing resources. Um, one of my son came home, and you'll kill me if he sees this, but I don't think he will. <laughs> but he has given me consent. He's given me consent. Um, I asked him about this report, and this report had said that, you know, 90% um, of parents, what was it, said something around pornography had, oh, that pornography was a problem for young people. They only asked yes or no, right? So you think, if you have to answer that question, is pornography a problem for young people? Yes or no? So I want to think something like 95% said it is, right? Yeah, so I asked sure. my son, who was 10 at the time. He was in year, um, first year of intermediate. And he said, mum, that's a stupid question. It's a problem for some people, but not for others. I mean, there's one person in my class, but he's a dickhead. And we all know that he's been, I won't tell the story on because it's been recorded. But I learned from that moment of what my son was knowing and thinking about and experiencing. Mm -hmm. Because the key to age appropriate is about knowing what's right for your child, okay? And the reason I like that book is you'll read it with them. If they're not interested, they'll go, Ugh, and walk away. If they are interested, they will have questions. But what you've told them is, it's okay. It's okay to ask questions. And you know that they're getting the right information. So throughout all my research with parents and young people, you know, that book for 12, 13 year olds, I think is awesome. I think yeah. it's a fabulous resource. And people have slammed me for saying that. They've told me I'm grooming children. But if you've worked in this space long enough, you'd know that basically hiding or silencing information causes shame. It causes yeah. people like my parents in my research who talked about still feeling dirty about their bodies as adults. Mm. not wanting to get undressed in front of their kids because they still felt shame about their bodies. Um, this, I didn't have a single parent group that I interviewed, and I did a lot of them, who didn't disclose some form of sexual abuse through shame, hiding information. They didn't know what was wrong. Wow. And to me, isn't that why we're here? We're here because I want my students, I want my parents to, you know, I want to have healthy relationships and feel good about who we are. And that's what sexuality education is about. It's about our identity. It's about who we're attracted to. And it's about what we actually do. I could give you a million stories from 30 years in this space. And so I'm willing to put up with the crap. I, I bet. <laughs> and I have, I've had to deal with a lot of crap. 
But I'm, I'm, I, I look at those young people who have sat in front of me when they've been dealing with some pretty bad stuff, and I'm thinking, no, it's not worth it. We need to do this. It's important. And, oh, and here's another thing. We're also working with the Netherlands on this project, right? So right. to pull my tongue up beyond the birds and bees, our online platform, mm -hmm. the Netherlands have some of the best rates of um, contraceptive use, lower rates mm -hmm. of everything that's negative, because they acknowledge that young people are sexual beings. Right? It doesn't mean they're having sex. It means they're making sense of the world around them. You know? So. I think, I think a lot of parents when they get nervous about this sort of stuff, yep. I, I think there's sometimes a clear delineation between primary school kids and secondary school kids, right? And and, mm -hmm. and sex and health education might be fine for secondary school, but keep it out of the primary schools. They're yeah. just little children. I, I asked a few people that I work with and, and friends of mine, I said, if if you didn't learn anything about this sort of stuff at school, when would you have learned it from your parents? And the overwhelming answer to that was too late. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just classic, isn't it? And if I give you what my young people wanted to know, same thing. They were saying that the parents are not talking. That, and you've got to remember, society has changed. And so, yes, there is some parental responsibility to open up the conversations. Now, what I mean by that is not just, okay, we're going to have a talk. Because you know what happens, it's yeah. like, all right, conversations happen throughout life. So primary school, it starts with what's consent in year one, right? Consent begins from there. No, you can't steal that other person's pencil case. No, you don't have to do this unless that person's given you consent, right? So that continues. What's a good friend? Okay, so if I asked you what's a good friend, you might say, well, you know, you be respectful and you ask them what they want and you you play fairly doesn't that just the same thing as we move into adulthood and relationships yeah. good mm. communication so in the primary school rec relationships and sexuality education is about building relationships the only thing that some parents are not happy about is naming body parts right and we do do that in year one all right simple as that this is a vulva penis etc now, we know from extensive research that that protects young people against sexual abuse, right? And, you know, I wanted to make sure that my young sons, you know, knew their own body parts, but also to respect other people's body parts, right? You don't have the right to go and touch somebody else. So that's sexuality education, right? Simple as that. And as we move into year seven, eight, that's when they start to look at things like contraception and conception. But... Yeah, you know, a lot of young people have seen the two dogs humping. <laughs> They've got an idea. They've watched the movies. You think about, I don't know about you, Pat, and I don't know, Chewy, if you've got kids. You think about some of the movies they watch now. They're learning about relationships, gender expectations, um, sex, co lack of condom use, right? You don't see it in movies. And porn has 3% of porn shows condom use. So... Yeah, you know, and they're they, and they it can and get it all, and they can get it all here if they if they've got them. Oh. Um, hey, listen, just and, to maybe maybe yeah. to wrap up based on your experience, because I want to bring it back to the Nicola, Nicola Willis comment, yes. uh, which again was you know based on our values and our views of the world, I want my education system to be focused on teaching my children to read and write and do math. This is a national party thing at the moment; they're trying to move away from yeah, anything that's not just academia. Um, but that that her percept perception might be the minority. But as you say, it's loud, it's often religious, yep. it's often conservative. What would you say specifically to those parents, those caregivers, those families who are like, yep. don't don't teach my kids, any, don't say penis to my kids or, or whatever, even more minor things that it is. What would you say to those parents yep. to help them get over, pardon the pun, that hump um, to yep. maybe make their kids safer and you know give their kids more information about the world around yep. them as themselves yep. being a part of that world? And I think that's a really valid point too. Like I suppose I've been in this field long enough that I see everyone's views. First of all, you can't shout at your children. I've got many students who have grown up in those types of families who have also felt they've missed out on a lot of key things for their relationships as they get older. But your values are important and you shouldn't be sharing your values with your children. They want to hear what you think. 
But they live in a world that's now very different and you need to allow them to have sexuality education in school and remember that it focuses on critical thinking, developing the skills for relationships, right? And the skills to be inclusive. You don't have to agree with people who might identify as a different gender, because um, that's a big area that a lot of them are worried about, that we're trying yeah. to change children's gender. You can't change a child how they feel about themselves, but you can have conversations and make them feel safe and supported. So first of all, one, I'd say, remember that, Go and look at what the curriculum is. It's you, You'll be surprised if you talk with your school and actually go and look at what they're teaching, how good it is. Secondly, um, I, I do agree that schools need to consult better with parents. So that's probably my number one thing I want to write about from my research is that all the parents in my uh, research were so supportive of RSE, but they didn't feel they knew enough what was being taught and they wanted schools to consult and just explain it a bit more. So I would say to those parents, don't listen to all the stuff you're hearing in the media, go and talk to your school and your teacher and tell them what you want and find out also a shared space. But remember, it's about those skill, those critical thinking skills so your young person can navigate the world. And that's what we want. A um, couple of comments and then one question and then we'll wrap up, yep. uh, Tracy. Uh, Politiki, we says, what I would have given for asexuality to be discussed during sex ed could have saved yeah. me a whole lot of time and grief. Uh, Brenda says, uh, in the 80s, no sex ed in my high school, four girls in my class pregnant at 15. Yep. Uh, Jay says, uh, I am a 21-year-old individual who is gay and grew up in conservative Southland. I don't agree with Nicola Willis's view on sex education. It lacks breadth and inclusivity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just there's been uh, tons of chats going through, but there's just a mm. few of them. And one question. And can I, I think say, that, if you just yep. if they want to have a look at my thesis online, for example, that's yep. the same stories coming through when you're when you shelter people or you silence stuff. It does a lot of harm. Yeah. It's it's so consistent as well when you go out and see those stories and you have people yep. um, that that recount their upbringing and that sort of thing uh, and there's some devastating stories there as well yeah. you know people who were sheltered um found out who they were much later in life completely yep. cut ties with their parents either from their direction or the parents direction and you you can't you can't suppress who someone is without no. some massive consequences down the line. It's yeah. it's basically a, it's a, it can be an emotional or mental health version of kids who are left handed being forced to write right handed before yeah. we thought it wasn't the tool of the devil to be left handed. And you know we 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 know the research that's come out of that that talks about those kids used to do things many of them like stuttering and have issues around lots of things because they were forced to do something yeah. unnatural. I don't see yeah. it as any different, but maybe it's more mental and emotional than physical, but still yeah. being forced to do something you're not why. is the worst thing. Yeah, and that's why we've moved away from the word sex education. But did you notice that's what Nicola Willis said? Because yeah. it, they, it's a, a rhetoric, right? So say sex, sex scares people. But if you look at that book, Welcome to Sex, it's about understanding care for others, diversity, knowing your body parts. And I love that comment about asexuality. So I was talking with a young boy the other day who see he's 19, identifies as, you know, as um, male and everything else, but he just doesn't want a girlfriend, right? Not interested. Likes a sport. He said, I can't be bothered. But everyone keeps telling me, I've got to get a girlfriend. He says, I don't want to be anything. I just want to be me. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just that pressure on people to, can't we just let our people to be themselves? And lastly, Tracy, just a question that I think a lot of people have on their mind as well. I wonder how easy access to hardcore porn has changed society. If you've been doing this for 30 years, then you will have oh, seen, yeah. I've, held it, I've held it my cell phone once already, but you'll have seen the inclusion of these into society yeah. and how access to things like hardcore porn and everything is now in most teenagers' pockets. How has that yeah. changed society? And maybe, I mean, if you could briefly tell us maybe, um, how has it changed how we need to talk about sex and sexuality yeah. in general? Well, great question, because that's a big part of my research that I did with um, other, the classification office, et cetera. Young people can access it, and they are accessing it because no one's talking about sex, so how am I going to learn? All right, you yeah. can't blame young people for what adults do to start with. Um, and what we are finding is that there has been an increase in problems, gendered issues around um, 
people having anal sex, all right, not necessarily because they wanted to, but they've seen it in porn and they want their partner to try it. And so that's issues of communication, consent. What are your values? How do you deal with that if someone's pressuring you? You know, and so what happens if, if we go back to that very beginning comment from Nicola Willis, if imagine a parent though, a parent says, now it's really important that you always please your partner, all right? And then your partner wants to have anal sex, but you don't want to, but you've been told you've got to please your partner. So sexuality education gets people to critique and say, what would you do in that situation? Yeah, right. And that's really can I just finish with a couple of things. The, the findings of my thesis, which I've got to write up, is basically it's been positive. I've been I've, I've done a positive thesis in terms of how do we help parents? How do we support all parents? And the number one thing is to ask open questions. Don't be judgmental. Don't go on the fear and shame. It's like, what do you think about that? And that's like, oh my golly, what are they going to say? But that's the most important part of education is both of you learning together and saying, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, what do you think? Should we try and find out? Or where can we? And it's those shared moments that young people go, ah, it's safe to talk to my parent. And isn't that cool? And that's what I love about, I don't know about you two, I love being a parent. It's hard work, (laughs) but it's cool. They challenge me now as as 19 year olds. Damn it. (laughs) That's true. That's true. A lecturer in the School of Health Sciences, University of Canterbury, that's Dr. Tracy Cleland. And um, if people want to find your research, we'll, we'll put a link in our socials and that kind of stuff as well. But if people I'll want to go looking you. for it now or before we get it up there, how do they find it, Tracy? Um, so at the moment, my PhD, which I'll write some more articles from, I will send you the link. They can download it for free. Just look at the findings and the conclusion. The findings are just all stories from parents based on and linked to theory. The stories will prove to you why we need to do this is so good awesome. and hey, tra- i also um just one thing don't forget yep. to pull away tanga beyond the birds and bees our new platform which we've created for parents and young people with correctly with correct knowledge that they can go and look at all free not sponsored by anyone we just wanted to pull together the best stuff for parents so i'll give Perfect. you that link too that's amazing. Hey, thanks, Tracy. We really appreciate you giving us some time all the way from China this evening yeah. and your afternoon. So thanks for joining yeah. us. Cool. No problem. Hey, lovely. All the best. Thank you, bye. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much. Uh,